when did you start it uh, with the idea? I mean, with the idea of launching a new stock exchange. Was that a few years ago, a few months ago, maybe five years ago? So it's an interesting story. Um, so actually, the, the original concept was born in back in 2015. And one of our clients at Kessian Capital, which is our FCA UK regulated business, which was the and still is the Swiss Stock Exchange. And we approached the Swiss Stock Exchange and said, there's this new technology called blockchain technology. We'd like to build a new secondary market for crowdfunding opportunities. Because I always describe crowdfunding as the Hotel California, where you can mm -hmm. check in, but you can never leave. <laughs> so, so what we want it's to a, do... It's, is, a, it's, a, it's a nice uh, song. Anyway. Exactly. And it has a nice song to it. Yeah. Um, so what we wanted to do is we wanted to create a secondary market. So we could have liquidity. Um, within that market. They, they took it all the way up to the board level, but they decided it's too much of a micro play for them. The amount of due diligence that they would have to do for a $100,000 listing is the same that they would have to do for a $100 million listing. So they, they said, love the idea, love the concept, but we wish you well in it and keep us posted. Um, we then... I then started to do some work with the Gibraltar Stock Exchange and I was advising them into their tokenization strategy as well because the Gibraltar government had brought in what's called a DLT framework and that they, they raised some capital in an ICO back in early 2018 and I pleaded with the Gibraltar Stock Exchange to focus on um, tokenized securities because I thought that's the future of the market rather than on ICOs. Um, they decided at the time not to listen to me, which is absolutely their choice. Um, mm -hmm. And they they pursued this ICO market. And unfortunately, we all know what happened to the ICO market. Um, so because of this, I decided, you know what, enough's enough. I'm not going to look to partner up with anyone else. So in 2018, we did a, a kind of high level analysis of the marketplace and decided that Europe was actually probably not the best place for us to launch an exchange. And the reason for that, and I know it's in one of your questions, but it kind of, it touches upon it now, but there, there's obviously within Europe, there's a thing called CSDR, the Central Securities Depository Regulations. Mm -hmm. And within those regulations that that it provides that you have to use an mtf has to use a csd in order to settle the trades and unfortunately there's no csd in europe that accepts tokens as a kind of financial instrument and set and can settle them in a csd and therefore we had to look outside of the jurisdiction and we we ended up we, we, we did actually have a look at a few places in the Caribbean and we ended up in Barbados, partly because they were very open to it. They, they wanted to be kind of involved in the new fintech generation. They just had a change of government and they were far more progressive as to what they want to do. And we also kind of convinced them that what Cayman is to the funds industry, if if Barbados gets this right, Barbados could be that to the tokenized securities industry. I see. But at that time, uh, uh, Barbados was still more or less part of Great Britain. So, but uh, a week ago, uh, it's becoming completely it's become independent. A so, what? What is the? I mean, so, did you know at that time already that it's going to be an independent republic, or was that? So the okay. only thing that's actually changed, and I, I'm, I'm actually good friends with the um, High Commissioner of um, Barbados to the UK, um, and the, it hasn't been, it, it's always been independent since the, I think the 60s. So, but, but it has been a 
part um, of the it, Commonwealth. It, well, it's still part of the Commonwealth. All that they've done is they've now removed the Queen as their head of state and they've become yes. a republic. So Thank they you. now have what used to be the, the governor general over in Barbados is now going to be is now going to be the president. So it hasn't really changed anything. I think it's just I think that they feel that they're a little bit more in control of their own destiny. I see. OK, OK. <laughs> it's, but it's, uh, you, you, you can imagine that uh, uh, Barbados, I mean, uh, it raised some questions towards uh, regulators, towards uh, investors, etc. It does, and and we have considered that. So, so one of the things that we're we're doing, we 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 are FCA regulated as well in the UK. So we have in Barbados, we have a stock exchange license, we have a brokerage license, and very soon to be a, a central securities depository license. But what we're doing in um, the rest of the world is, and this kind of folds into some of your questions here. So, so. I'm not answering them necessarily specifically, but in general terms, what we're, we're also talking to the regulator in Mexico about joining their regulatory sandbox and having what's called a novel model. And so if we are regulated in Mexico, that will give us access to Central and South America, excluding Brazil. We're talking mm -hmm. to the regulator in Malta so that we have access to Europe. We're, we're talking literally just beforehand, I was talking to someone in Mauritius who will give us access to the African continent. We're talking to the regulator in Singapore and we're talking to ADGM in Abu Dhabi. So what we want to be is we want to be in strategic locations around the world so that we are a platform, a multi-jurisdictional platform, but operating off what we call a global single order book. I see. OK. And then I go to one of my, my questions, uh, and that is, after the launch, what will you really offer to the market after the launch? Okay, so, so I, think the, I think traditional markets are very kind of, subject to their legacy systems and traditional ways of doing business. And I think um, there's, there's a possibility that they're ripe for disruption. I'm not saying we're going to change the marketplace completely, but I think there's certain things within, within the marketplace that traditional stock exchanges don't cater for. So, for, for, for example, they are very set in terms of timing. So they only operate, say, between nine and four o'clock in the afternoon. Our, our exchange will be a 24-7 exchange. I think the assets that we'll be launching on our exchange, I think will hopefully be considered to be more exciting. Um, so not only can we do traditional security, so we could do equities and ETFs and and potentially bonds as well. Um, but we're also looking at alternative assets and how we can make those alternative assets more tradable, more ownable by a mass population. So what that means is, for example, fractional ownership of a physical asset. So if you take, for example, a painting, mm -hmm. you could have a Picasso painting that's worth $100 million dollars and break yes. it up into 100 million units and sell each unit for a dollar. And then people could trade those units on the secondary market. And therefore, where someone, very few people around the world have the ability to spend 100 million on buying a single asset, there's millions of people around the world that have a few dollars to spend on buying an asset or part of an asset. Yes. So. I think we can do that with things like artwork. We can do it with racehorses. We can do it with rare whiskey barrels. We can do it with buildings. We can do it with container ships. Um, so, or you could do it with land. I mean, it's been done with land before and 
we just got to make sure that it's structured in the right way and the provenance and the the background and the paperwork all stacks up no but that that are i mean that are tangible assets i can i can see the painting i can see the building but you are also working with i mean with rights with licenses with uh, maybe intangible, intangible. assets and Absolutely. Uh, so uh, uh, so let me uh, yeah let me explain that one so, so actually that's the one i'm even more excited about i think the yes. i think the fractional ownership is great and it gives people the ability to de democratize say a picasso painting where they could never afford it on their own and i think yeah. that's brilliant if we can do that across the globe however i think what what excites me because it's far more to do with actual business is the intangible assets like you said so what we've created is a thing called a royalty token and a royalty token is a contractual right to receive income based on the revenue of a business it might be yeah. income it might be profit related more likely to be income related or revenue related so if you if you take any any business let, uh, and let's just call it for for example's sake a solar farm in in holland mm -hmm. so if you had a solar farm in in holland and it's producing whatever 100 megawatts of of um, electricity what you know for example is you know how much electricity you're going to be selling and what the price of it is so what you could do is you could pre-raise the capital and say okay I know that I'm going to generate, let's call it for argument's sake, 10 million euros a year. And of those 10 million euros a year, because people have funded my project, I'm going to give them 30%, 50%, 70% of my turnover. And I'm going to do that in perpetuity, or I'm going to do it for the life of 25 years, for the length of the power purchase agreement, whatever it ends up being. So, so that's kind of one example. I think another example and, and something that we're hoping to capture, and this is hopefully where, where things start to explode in the future, um, mm -hmm. is we want to do something within, say, the entertainment space where yeah. people have mass followers, so mass influencers. So if you take, and I'm not sure if you're, aware of who rihanna is but uh, Rih rihanna's a, a pop singer from yes. barbados originally and she's got 200 million followers on mm -hmm. instagram and twitter yeah. so if she decided that she wants to tokenize her next album and give all of those fans the opportunity to invest in her next album and be able to connect closer to her. It's just an example, by the way. We haven't got Rihanna who's agreed to do this. I'm, I'm just, mm -hmm. just using it as an example. I've got to put that caveat out there. Um, but if she's able to tokenize her next album and say, okay, not only can you listen to my music, you can also own a part of the revenue and, be and become far more engaged with me as an individual because I'm closer to you because you're, you're now going from being uh, best. part of me for a small a very small part correct correct and and they earn revenue and then they but the beauty about something like this is they can also trade those units on a secondary market so they don't have a stuck investment like crowdfunding they have the ability then to say you know what i think rihanna's album has run her course i'm not going to get anything out of it going forward i'm going to sell my units yeah I can imagine that also for, I mean, for uh, films, uh, for music, uh, contracts, etc. I 100%. mean, uh, Madonna, Rolling Stones, etc. But but I'm curious about about data. I mean, there are a lot of companies who are owning a lot of data. Yes. Data, data. Yes. Yeah. Yes, also, absolutely. also intangible assets in a way because you can't touch them. They are in your computer system. Of course. 
So, so, so Facebook and Google and all of these entities, they've got huge, I mean, they are data companies ultimately. Yes. So, so one of the things that, that's really interesting, we're talking to one of the leading premier football clubs at the moment. Um, I can't tell you which one because we're under NDA, but, okay. but you know who they are. They're a household day. Um, and what we're looking at is how can they, how, how can we potentially tokenize some of their assets? So whether that ends up being we tokenize their, their football pitch or we tokenize their trophy cabinet, whatever it ends up being. Um, or it might be so, some revenue streams that they tokenize as well. But one of the things that they're really keen on doing is they, they have millions and millions of followers around the world but they or fans around the world, but they don't know who they are. They don't know how to engage with them mm -hmm. and they don't know how to um, actually realize what value that they have. So what, one of the things that we said is if we, if we were to set up some kind of tokenization vehicle for them and securitize some of their assets, whatever assets those end up being, then what that gives them the ability to do is have these data points so that they know not only who, I'm not gonna say it's gonna be for all their fans because 99% of their fans probably won't buy anything. But if you can get to know 1% of your fan base and that 1% represents a million people, 2 million people, whatever it is, and you know that they're really engaged fans because yes. they're the ones who are buying your assets, I think it gives, in the same way that it gives Rihanna that thing, it's far more than just being a member of the fan club. You suddenly realize, actually, these people are more than just fans. They're actually invested in me yes. rather than just interested in me. Yes, 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 yes. I got it. I got it. Um, something that has to do also with, I mean, the risk and compliance issues we are writing about is, of course, uh, AML. Yes. And uh, I'm wondering how can you guarantee to, to the regulators that your, your system is, uh, uh, I mean, I don't say 100% okay, but at least... As robust uh, as it can be. Yeah. So, so, I, so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering how is there a special, uh, I mean, uh, software uh, program or how do you, uh, the, I mean, the role of the gatekeeper uh, can you tell me something about that? Absolutely. So, so we're actually using a third-party company. Um, it, it's a Canadian entity, um, and they specialize in um, KYC and KYB services and AML yes. services. So what they do is everyone who signs up to the platform will have to go through full KYC, AML checks, but also categorization checks. And... We're also taking it to the level that we, we, we have obviously in the UK, where we're also doing for individuals, we're, we're also doing what's called an appropriateness check. So in terms of risk, do you understand what risks you're do, taking yes, yes, when yes. you're buying this product? So we don't want people to come to, to, our, to our exchange and buy things and think that they're getting involved in the crypto markets we want them to understand this is a measured investment. This is insecurities. They've got to go through all the KYC AML checks. We have all the adverse media checks. Um, we also have a liveness check to make sure that they're not just sending in a piece of paper or holding up a piece of paper. So there's checks to make sure that that person corresponds right. with, yeah. with the um, passport or, or identity checks. Yes. There's obviously... In different jurisdictions, there's different requirements in terms of what identity documents they can produce. So I think one of our things is we're doing all of our checks to an FCA standard and slightly beyond, because what we want to do is take the highest common denominator to make sure that everything that we're doing goes unchallenged. Now, does that mean that, that people it's not 100% accurate, so we mm -hmm. can't give a guarantee, 
but we we've got all the reasonable steps in place in order to do that and the other thing that we have to do is we have to do an annual audit and an, an, an external annual audit so at the moment we're actually going through the process of doing the the annual audit on KYC and AML checks that we've then got to submit to the regulator so that they they are happy with exactly what we're doing and if we need to enhance it in any way we can do that. Is that Canadian company able to do that all over the world that know your customer checks? I think they cover from memory it's something like 164 countries so at the to start off with we're not going to have it open to everyone around the world because we we can't necessarily cater for everyone around the world there, there are going to be some countries that we would automatically exclude the sanctioned countries obviously and obviously in terms of the due diligence of the level of kyc and aml you go from simplified to standard to enhanced we're not doing any simplified checks. All of them are going to be standard checks. And anyone who, who flags up with a certain kind of risk score would then have to go through the enhanced checks. Mm -hmm. I see. Uh, talking about risks, uh, I'm not an IT guy. <laughs> that is, uh, Neither am uh, I, but, don't but, but, but I know that you're gonna work with 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 uh, cloud services from Amazon. Is that okay? Is that right? Correct. So actually both. So so we're going to be using AWS, which is Amazon, and we're yes. also going to be using Azure, which is Microsoft. I see. Okay. So so, so the so risk. In terms I mean, of the, the the cyber risk is is covered by external. Uh, partly uh, that. Partly that. But also, and I'm, believe me, I'm not a technology person at all. I kind of understand. But what we're also doing is we're bu building this thing called a middleware layer. And in that middleware layer, it's a bit like Amazon. Amazon has all the different counterparties that can plug into it so that, and it has business logic built into it. And because it's got business logic built into it, you can also build in security parameters. So everyone has to filter in through the kind of external environment into the middleware layer. There's security checks in the middleware layer. Then it goes out to the servers, whether it's Amazon or Azure or whatever it ends up being. And only if all the things match along the process does something get verified. Yes, okay, thank you. Uh, I have two two more questions because you have already uh, answered quite a lot of questions. So I yes, will sorry, not... I've, I've got no, 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 no. It's very good. It's very good. I'm, I'm very thankful for that. Uh, uh, what about the competition? Uh, and any reaction already from other stock exchanges? Uh, are they aware of the fact that you are launching this uh, initiative? Are it's... they? Yeah, it's really interesting, actually. We, we, we speak to all, all of our competitors. It's every, people actually in this space, because it's so nascent, I think everyone's really kind of trying to bring up the industry together. Mm -hmm. And so there is a collaborative approach. And also one of the things, I mean, I was discussing this with um, SDX the other day and these people over in the Seychelles and Mauritius, and we know people in the UK, we know people in the US, we know people in Canada, we know people over in Singapore. There's not that much competition, but we're, we're all trying to get to the same place, maybe by different avenues. I don't think necessarily the, the competition is looking at things like royalty tokens, not yet anyway. Mm -hmm. I'm sure mm -hmm. when we start launching, they will do because it will be a new asset class that they've got to consider. But it also depends on their jurisdiction, what they can do with these things. So I think one of the really interesting things is everyone is talking now about getting their own platforms underway, but we're also looking at how we can have interoperability between platforms. Because ultimately, it goes back to the whole point that 
that we said earlier with with Amazon. Amazon is really a mass collection of retailers around the world that aggregate all the products all together in one one site. If there's a possibility that as long as people adhere to certain minimum standards and we can agree what those standards are throughout the industry, I think everyone is looking at how we can make the industry grow faster, better, more efficient, more cost effective, and also, for, certainly from our perspective, we want to be financially inclusive. So we, we want to welcome retail investors. Someone like the Swiss Stock Exchange, they're far less interested in retail, but they realize mm -hmm. that, that there's companies like us, the retail people feel, feed, the, feed the institutional people. So I think there is a collaborative approach, but don't get me wrong, everyone has their own kind of agenda. Sorry, the, if I don't move enough, the, 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 the light switch is off. No, no, um, no, no, no problem. <laughs> but I think everyone has their own agenda. I do think it's a collaborative space. And I think also the technology that everyone's using, everyone's building their own systems. So it makes far more sense at some point to say, okay, you've got this, we've got this, what can we do together to make sure that we're not duplicating on absolutely everything? I see, I see, okay. Then maybe the last question, I know it's a little bit, uh, we have to look a little bit uh, into the future, but is there any, can you say anything about uh, about figures by the end of this year, maybe in five years, revenues, what is, what is the strategy? Yeah, so, so I would say in terms of we're hoping to go to market with between three and five listings, and that should happen, we're hoping Q1 next year. We're, we're hoping that I think it will be a snowball effect. As soon as people start seeing that there's this different way of doing things, I think we're going to start getting a lot of interaction. As soon as we get something like a big film or a big music person or a football club or something on board, mm -hmm. I think that the whole thing will start snowballing. Yeah. Um, so I think my, my ambition is that we, we get by the end of 22, I would say that we would have somewhere between 12 and 20 listings on our platform. Mm -hmm. um, and by 2030, which is kind of a long way out there, but but completely blue sky, blue horizon type, type activities, I would hope that we have globally millions of users on our platform, that we are across multiple jurisdictions in the world so that people can trade locally or internationally as seamlessly as possible. And I also think that... Um, we, we should ha have, by 2030, we should have hundreds, if not maybe even touching the thousands, low thousands of listings on our platform. I see. So, oh, so it's, it, it's a big ambitious project, but I do think that with technology, with the, with, with the pandemic actually, the pandemic has made the world smaller from a technology perspective. Mm -hmm. And people are far more interested in the sharing economy and being a part of something, I think, than they were previously. And we've seen that with things like GameStop and uh, all of these things. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think it's also just worth mentioning, when, when going back to your previous question about our, our competition, I think one of the things our outstanding kind of values in our business or, or, or um, competitive edge is... What I think one, we are far more innovative, innovative, I think, than our competition. Two, I think the team that we've got surrounding us is second to none. So we 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 have our, our chairman is um Martin Graham. He used to be head of markets at the London Stock Exchange, and he, he was head of the A market, the alternative investment market. Yes. And he grew that using technology and networking and stuff to be at the at the at the point that he was there, the largest growth market in the world, larger than Nasdaq. Um, 
we we have a chap called Paul who is our head of operations. He comes from a background of the Australian Stock Exchange. We have a chap called Phil, who's our CFO, and and he came from the Gibraltar Stock Exchange. We have a chap called Simon, who's our head of markets, and he came from uh, GXG, which is a Danish stock exchange. They, 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 they've now ceased to exist, but we, we, we've got, I would say in terms of exchange and commercial experience within the exchange world, I don't think anyone's got more experience and more kind of credibility than us. I see. Maybe the, the, the very last question, the waiting list. What about the waiting list? So, I, I, I read something about the waiting list. So what we will be doing is hopefully next week, week we will be launching our new website. Mm -hmm. And on that website, we're going to give people the ability to join our community so that when we are ready to launch and we've got everything in place, as we should do, then we can go to the community and say, OK, these are the the things that are coming to market. And we, we, we are talking to people that have got some weird and wonderful projects, but also some quite traditional projects as well. So we're talking about people with, with, that are in the mining industry. We're talking to people that are in the um, alternative energy space. We're talking to someone who's got some very, very well renowned pieces of art. Um, we're talking to people who've got stuff in the farming space, hotels. We're talking to people also in the metaverse. So I know the metaverse is, is quite a hot topic at the moment, but there, there's also a possibility in the future that we, we, we can tokenize real estate. We could have a, a REIT within the metaverse itself. So I think there's all these opportunities. I, I think it's hugely exciting. I, I'm, I'm really excited about the opportunities I that it brings. I, I, I see that you are very excited. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, too no, excited. No, no, but you, well, I, I know the same feeling because I, I also I created also products, uh, magazines in the past, and so on. So I know, I know that feeling. Uh, so, excellent. Uh, I, excellent. And uh, well, I, I really can understand that uh, it's uh, it's 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 a vibe. It's really interesting, interesting, and, and especially you. especially afterwards when you see the results. Yes, you can say okay. I, I, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I'd love to. I'd love it if genuinely someone in Venezuela was be, being able to buy a stake in the Empire State Building, or yeah. or someone in Mogadishu can buy a slither of a Picasso painting. Yes, yes, yes. yes I just yes. think it, it it gives people access to something that they would never dream was attainable beforehand. Yes, yes, okay. Yes, thanks to, thanks to technology, thanks to the infrastructure, and also thanks to Amazon, et cetera, and, and, and the big tech. It's true, it's yeah, true. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is the evolution of it. Yeah, yeah, you, you can you can say okay, I'm not agree with uh, their policy, or but it's a fact. It's a, you can you cannot deny it any longer. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah.